Hello everybody and welcome to another hobby cheating video and today we've got a big one. Today we're going to take you through every step of my Golden Demon project, one of my sort of dream projects. Today we're going to create Bane Lash. Uh, the strict technomancer that is Vincey V. Let us get to the technique in learned Vincey V style. If you're a longtime fan of this channel, you know I love Imperial Knights, Renegade Knights, Traitor Knights, whatever. Big, stompy robots. Love them. Can't get enough. Now, I've painted several of them. I've taken them to competitions and such, and they've done pretty well. But I really want to paint one that I think, well, will win a Golden Demon. That's the goal here. So in this video, we're going to dive all the way in, and I want to make something really special. Bane Lash, I think, is one of the coolest knights. He's, you know, uh, out of House Divine, one of the first houses to fall to the ruinous powers, and I've always wanted to see him brought to life. With the release of the new Abomination Knight, I finally had sort of the last missing bit that I thought would make this absolutely perfect. So this video is going to go from construction all the way through to finished project. And we're going to really, really get into the detail. I'm excited. I hope you are too. Let's get over to the desk. All right. Well, we're going to begin with assembly. And these knights, things like this, have so many, many, many pieces. Uh, and so here is my strongest piece of advice for you. When you're dealing with these really big projects, with these big, you know, miniatures like this, you see I have all sorts of sanding sticks out. I've got my sprue goo. I've got my normal glue. I've got everything. You know, I'm popping on Uncle Adam and watching him stream on Twitch and stuff like that. Uh, that's the kind of thing you want to do. Treat it like its own project. Don't rush it. Oftentimes with assembly, it becomes something that just has to get done. It's simply racing for the destination. But when it comes to a really important project, something really big, something you want to do a good job on, then don't treat it as uh, a cost. Treat it as part of the journey itself. Get into it. Find the zen of the motorcycle maintenance here, right? So here, this is just hours and hours of work as I'm, you know, watching every, watching a channel pulling every piece, cutting things, sanding things, assembling it carefully, dry fitting, test fitting, gluing in place, so on and so forth. When you set about uh, to sort of make the assembly a real part of the project, it can just make your life so much easier down the road because then things are clean and smooth. Remember, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure, and nowhere is that more true than when you're going to run into uh, potential challenges painting everything down the road. And this one was very fun because as I was going along, I realized I was going to build half the night as Imperial and half the night as Chaos uh, and use that to tell the story of the split that always comes along with Slanesh. I will fully admit that when I started this, I didn't have this idea of the split 50-50 night. This came up almost as organically as I was assembling it, as I was going through the bits, and as I was putting it together. It was a happy accident of sorts. And when you're working on a project, even something so big, so serious, like a Golden Demon project, don't ever, ever turn away when that inspiration knocks the door. It's so important to sometimes just follow that good idea that you have. It won't always work out, but when it does, it'll be awesome. And I love this new concept of the sort of split night, the Imperial and the Chaos, it's past and it's present. And I think it's very Slanesh, as it traditionally has a lot of that sort of split, you know, male, female type of thing going on. Perfect for the Dark Prince. Now I decided to start with the base here, and why am I starting with the base? I'm starting with the base because it's, well, relaxing. And also because I know when I get down to the end of painting the night, I'm going to be exhausted. And I'm not going to put in the effort that I should 
to this base if I do it at the end as opposed to if I do it at the beginning. So instead, I'm doing this nice, simple, relaxing, messy, pigment-infused, slap washes around, dry brush stuff, you know, play with colors uh, early. I already know what color the night's going to be, so there's no risk to doing this thing early. It's not like it's going to clash. And I made sure as I built it to test fit it to his feet so I knew exactly where he was going to stand. So once all of that's done, I did this first so I would force myself to put the time into it to make it look cool. And as I started playing around with those things and all the different textures that I had created through the many different rocks and grits and sand that I'd used, I think I came to something fun and interesting, although still relatively simple for the base. With that out of the way, it was time to begin working on the armor plates. Now, they're all primed in dark neutral gray from Pro Acryl, and then it was time to start adding in some of the white, okay? And here with the, the white, uh, and my white specifically uh, in this particular case, uh, is a little bit of uh, white primer uh, from Steino Res is actually what I'm using just for extra durability. Um, and I have the PSI set up at 40 PSI to really atomize it and thin it down. And there's a couple drops of thinner in there beforehand. And I want to create a unified lighting scheme. So here I have an old cutting mat and all of the pieces of armor are blue tacked onto the cutting mat in the position they will occupy on the night top to bottom, right? So they're all in order, you know, they're organized by side and so on and so forth. That way I can know and set my undershade and my light accordingly. As I continue to work on this, I'll sometimes pull a piece off, put it on an individual painting handle, but it always gets restored to this position zero here on the cutting mat. And the reason for that is so I can always keep my lighting scheme consistent across the entire miniature. Once that's down, it's time to start building up the individual plates. And when it comes to the individual armor plates, we're going to work in thin glazes with the airbrush. You'll see the colors scroll up at the top of the screen. The key with the airbrush is there's no reason not to work extremely thin. You can work so fast with the airbrush. Why not work thin? Even going over all of these plates and doing all of the different layers I'm going to do, which is a lot, this still didn't amount to more than 10 or you know, 11 hours of work, which in the scope of this whole project, maybe, maybe 12, maybe a few more, it doesn't matter. The point is it was maybe 10% or less of the whole project. And so that's nothing when it comes to what I'm going to put in brush painting time. So let's take the time, let's do these thin layers, let's do multiple glazes, let's take advantage of the tool that is the airbrush and how much we can cover how fast. Now you see me putting each one of these colors down. I should note that in between each shot, I'm actually of course doing the rest of the, the night uh, and pulling each piece off and, and doing it accordingly. Uh, to match what you see here. I'm not like doing one piece completely up. I'm doing all of the armor plates on the step you see here. They're just happening off camera. You'll also note that I'm working a lot of back and forth. That is to say, I'm back to light colors. I'll be back to glazes. And that's because each of these colors will have a different feeling, a different impact, a different intensity when put over top of the other colors. Bringing these thin glazes together in a, in a really harmonious way. And again, this is something that would to do with a brush would just take 10 times as long. But when I'm doing it with the airbrush, I can work fast, I can work smooth, and I don't have to worry. This what would normally take hours or days takes minutes. Now, the reason I'm working a little bit of a lighter color glow in to the underside of the shade is both because I find it visually compelling and interesting, but also because it just adds more to that light, dark, light transition. And that's always something you want to think about. Your shadows are fine, but shadows don't communicate much information. So if you have a chance to hide a little pop color in there in some way, to make it a little more visually interesting, to just add a little bit of zhuzh, why not? And it's going to tie in later with the freehand that I do.
And here he is after all the airbrush work is all done. With that out of the way, it's time to turn to the skeleton. And so we're gonna just begin, we're gonna add a lot of color to this by the time we're done, but we're gonna start out with a nice coat of magnesium. Now I'm shooting mainly either from straight on or just slightly below and above. So I'm not looking to cover every single nook and cranny with this magnesium. If there's a little bit of black still left in the very recesses from the underside, that's fine. Above with the silver gives us our zenithal, our light source on this guy. Now some of this stuff is going to end up being covered up by later armor plates. And, and that's okay. If it is, it will be dark in the shadows. But especially where things are going to be exposed, we want them to be nice and bright and shiny. It is really amazing how little of this ends up displaying. We want to reinforce and soften those shadows from below, and so that's why we bring this Payne's Gray ink in. It also adds a nice soft blue tone to our shadows, which will tie it in with some of the other blues we have in the shadows of the armor plates. You saw we were building in those turquoise and blue-green colors. We'll have the same sorts of things going on in the shadow on the metal, which, even though minor, will help to bring and tie the whole piece together. Now there's a lot of little rivets and edges, and we're going to go in and pick a lot of them out later, but we also want to just generally make sure that there's some uh, variation across them where the airbrush didn't necessarily hit. So a very, very light, soft dry brush of silver helps to really give that pop to all the edges and crisp points. Now, our next step is, of course, an oil wash. And I mix this thing up messy and at a couple different thicknesses. Uh, and I left in the whole part of me sort of mixing this stuff around because I wanted you to see sort of mixing an oil wash. Part of the thing I think with oil washes and people is they mix them way too thin and then it doesn't have any effect. You want your oil washes pretty thick. Like you want it to flow around, but you, you want a good amount of paint in there. And that's fine. It'll still run. The white spirits don't act like water. They, it doesn't have the same uh, cohesion so it, it or surface tension, so it really does flow a lot more easily and remember you can always clean it up later so you see here i have sort of two different thicknesses a very thin and then a slightly thicker one and i use these back and forth kind of using the first one to smooth out the second one and so on now i don't cover every single surface on the miniature that is to say like those the any large flat sort of rounded area there's really no reason for me to put a wash on it so i don't uh, I just wash the rest of the stuff in the end because of my ability to clean it up. With a normal wash, that would be suicide because you would see this hard line, uh, like a stain where the wash ended and then, you know, the, the part you did wash begins. But with an oil wash, since it's going to largely sink into the recesses very easily and I'm going to come back in and clean it up, it's no problem. I can just not cover those spaces and they'll blend into the other ones normally. Uh, makeup sponges are my key for cleaning up oil washes. I take about three drops of white spirits into the opposite side of the side that's wiping, and then I just wipey, 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 wipey. Um, I try to always wipe in like a downward motion, but you don't necessarily have to. Uh, you can just sort of scrub the thing. I like the soft makeup brushes because they're, you're much less likely to sort of do anything to your paint. Um, they are very gentle. They're obviously made for skin normally, so uh, they're not going to injure your, your paint or anything like that. And I just work my way around the whole model, cleaning it up and getting it ready for the next step. I want to break in here real quick and talk about these massive projects. Now, at this point, I don't know exactly how many hours I am into this, the total project is about 150-ish hours, 130, 150, somewhere in that range. It's a lot. And when you're dealing with a project of that size, right, that's like four work weeks, basically. Uh, you can't make the only goal the finished model. When you're dealing with these massive projects and things like these knights are good for it but you can do it with any figure you've got to set those micro goals those tiny little things that give you the dopamine hit that says hey you did something you accomplished something you got somewhere today you took another step on the road so as i was working through this guy maybe one day it was just like airbrushing some of the plates i want to get some of the plates done 
or maybe one day it was like, I'm going to get the free hand on this shoulder done. That's all. You know, that's going to be five, six, seven hours of work just on the free hand on this shoulder, but it's going to be worth it. When it's done, that's one more thing completed. And I get the same feeling, the same rush, the same excitement that I get out of completing a model that I'm doing for my army. So don't be afraid to set those little goals for yourself, those milestones. The journey can be just as rewarding as the ultimate destination. Now it's time for tedium. Uh, one of the downsides of the airbrush is that because it is so sort of all-encompassing in how it applies colors is it blasts all the edges and destroys any separation line you might have between things like the uh, the sort of edge of the armor plates here and the, the patterning, brocading, whatever around the edge uh, and the actual armor itself. So we have to re-instantiate that. The other thing that it can sometimes do is you've got to be able to sort of see what your job is going to look like when it's all done. So I slowly blacked in all the parts, including all the edges, and made sure everything had a nice defined line. Having the dark lines done, it was then time to do the light lines, and so I edge highlighted everything in a nice bright pink to magenta color. After I had gone to all that trouble, I realized the inner parts of the two bottom legs I actually wanted to be hazard stripes. So we taped off the half that we didn't want to cover, and we're going to restart with some hazard stripes. Let's talk about hazard stripes. I always start from black. I know some people like to start from white, but I'll show you why over the course of this I start from black. First of all, it lets me very easily modulate the gray in the black amount here and kind of set a nice universal color uh, across the whole thing. But then secondly, because when I do the white, I'm going to want us to do it um, at a higher PSI, and it's going to be sort of ink and things like that. Um, I can, as I move in thickness, so moving from the lower, uh, the, the more the more thin of the white, as you'll see, up into the darker colors, I can actually create an edge highlight. You'll see. Um, when I apply this little tape, this is just Tamiya tape. Um, it actually comes in this thinness, so this is like the two millimeter or something i don't know whatever it is it's the, it's the very thin one um you can find it just search for tamiya tape and get the thin one <laughs> it's very useful for hazard stripes and you notice how each time i'm comparing it to it marking the end spot and then moving the top down to where the bottom was um, you can actually do this you can actually lay down every strip and then pull out the middle ones you don't want to paint if you're looking to be exactly mechanically mathematically perfect um but I'm not even on a project like this. I'm I'm sort of there. There are limits to my patience. Uh, now going with the white, uh, you know, this is just some of the white ink, and I'm just building this up very slowly. A lot of what you see the airbrush doing isn't applying more paint. I'm just blowing air to make sure it's nice and smooth. Once that's there, I can then do my nice turquoise color, which will be the, the other color for the hazard stripes. Obviously, these aren't traditional yellow and black hazard stripes. On all of my uh, House Divine Knights, their hazard stripes are, uh, in between their legs, are turquoise and black. Just feels more appropriate to the overall color scheme. Of course, we have to rebuild in a little bit of those shadows because we do really want to impress upon people the sort of three-dimensional nature. And the inside of that leg is an area of extremely high shadow. You know, most of the night is hanging right over the top of that. And uh, so after building that back in, we're then ready to peel back the tape. And the nice part is because of the way the white ink versus the thicker turquoise works, you can see how it actually creates a very nice little soft, subtle edge on... Uh, on the turquoise. So you kind of get these, you can kind of get free edge highlights if you mix your consistencies right. Effectively, you want your first color to be slightly thinner than your later colors. It's a, it's a very odd trick. It's sort of an organic thing. You can't always bet on it, but it's really nice if you can get it to land. Like you can see how that looks like I edge highlighted the turquoise, but I didn't. There's always going to be errors. Masking is never perfect, and that's fine. Come back in, and fix it. Here I just have some of the black mixed with some of the, the pastel blue, same as I did with this color. Doesn't have to be perfect, it just has to be close. No one can tell with a tiny little line. And you build it back in very slowly. 
you can see how I'm not trying to cover it in one pass. Notice how I start with my brush in a very safe area where I'm not risking anything. A lot of this guy is going and correcting stuff. One of the things you probably have seen me do in this video is go back and forth, correct something here or there, or at least you've noticed something's changed in between shots. And that's because when you're going all the way, when you're going for Golden Demon, you don't allow mistakes to stand. You go back, you fix them immediately because you might forget them later. So don't ever hesitate to just get those things fixed. You will make mistakes. Errant brush strokes will happen. It's fine. Just fix it and move on. Now we're going to take a little detour into non-acrylic paints, namely some extreme metal chrome. And this is just here to pop up some of those really high highlights. With this metal, I really want it to shine. This is a Slanesh Knight. Uh, and so, of course, it should have some real shine and gaudiness to it. And I'm just hitting this on the highest highlights. And you'll notice one of my themes here across this is working broadly and then coming down to the very specific. And that's the same thing here. Whereas before I was working across the whole surface of the thing, applying broad highlights and shadows, now I'm working in very specific areas. And in the same way, I'm going to go ahead and start filling in some of the detail and then applying very careful shadow there. When you have areas of a lot of metal like this, a lot of steel, which is what this guy is, right? Or, or whatever future metal they have, I don't know. Steel 7, there you go. Yeah, it's Steel 7. That's what knights are made of, I'm sure of it. So when you have these future sort of metals, and they're all monotoned, that being the key, you have to come in and break that stuff up. That one color, no matter how much you recess line it, no matter how much you edge highlight it, is just going to be visually boring. And so that's where we, turning even some of those elements, copper, and as you'll see in a moment, cut, you know, things like the, the pipes, turning those into a different color, those little hints of color of different shades help to really break up the monotone nature and make it more visually interesting. Now, once again, with my magic gold recipe uh, that I used to actually do that, uh, you, you know, we want to still make sure we apply shading. Here is another great use of contrast through the airbrush. It's wonderful for warming up gold. A little bit of violet, a little bit of rattling grime. Boom, we have something that's really nice and matte and will help give a contrast of a shadow to this otherwise very bright metal. But of course, we can't just apply shades. We also have to apply highlights. And so on these surfaces, we want to make sure, especially the copper ones, that they have this pop out. So a very thin glaze of this silver just to make sure that that shine and the light are really under our direct control, which is what we want. At the same time, it's these tiny little details that matter. So things like the edges of every one of these little vents, every one of those would catch light and be a little tiny source of reflection. So we're going to take that silver and we make sure to catch every single one of those. Same with the edge and the separation and so on and so forth. Speaking of light, dark, light, dark, the inside of it uh, needs to appear very dark. So hence AK intense black to bring that all the way down and make it seem like, you know, that's there's it's something hidden in a recess, in a shadow, in that uh, cover over the, the gun there. So just very carefully uh, covering each one of those. On the journey to break up the, all the metal, of course, things like tubes and pipes and stuff like that are another excellent thing to, to hide a color on. So here again, I'm using my pop color. The main color of this guy, as you look at him, will obviously be the purple and the pink. But my pop color across him is going to be this bright blue. And so having uh, this blue appear on things like cables, gems, little tiny lights in the resource, in the recesses, it makes it so that color is there and present and keeps the eye moving and creates more visual interest. Let's talk about detail on a Golden Demon project. Each of these tubes has a texture to it. And we can't just rely on something like a wash to pick this all out. So of course, we're going to have to go in and manually highlight each little striation, each little texture line, whatever we want to call it, all the in each individual layer of the tube. And I do this through about three different layers getting smaller each time. That way we have a nice variation across the whole surface and we can reflect the light being uh, as it would be caught by these individual little striations. Uh, 
coming up to this sort of like eventually pastel blue integrated color that really is only going to be where it's the most exposed to the light. So each time we cover less and less. That is to say, I'm not outlining every tube all the way around. Same thing with these larger tubes on the bottom where it's in the center, the lower part and facing upward. So hence the most exposed to the light. We run the same series of highlights. When you're doing a competition project, you have to invest the time into every element of the thing. It's not as though you can just sit there and sleep on some part. That's not how something like Golden Demon especially works. Uh, every single piece, every single part, every single element of the miniature sort of needs to have an extremely high level of attention. Speaking of which, it's time to turn to the edge highlights and the glints for our metal to make sure it really shines. And for that, we're turning to the Molotow Chrome, which reflects like a mirror. And so all of the steel edges on this thing are going to be done in this Molotow Chrome. Now, this admittedly took a while because I do the entire skeleton as well with this, but I'm only showing you the gun because it's a lot easier to paint on camera than that giant unwieldy skeleton. Uh, so just tracing it around and making sure it pops out. Details like these bone protrusions that break up through the chaos side of him. Uh, here we're using our old contrast loaded brush technique uh, where the belly of the brush is full of contrast paint and then the top of it is full of a thicker paint. Now, if it was a, just a gaming piece, I would probably stop there. But, of course, we have to go farther. And again, this is where contrast paints are so useful, even for things like display competition pieces, because thinned down with a glaze, this night haunt into a glaze, this night haunt gloom is so perfect for this sort of subtle shade I want to apply to these bones. And the fact that it will also draw into the resources, uh, sorry, the recesses will make that even better, uh, especially with this kind of bone shape, the sort of striated stacked bone. Uh, with the horizontal lines. My least favorite type of bone, by the way. I, I much prefer the horns when they're just one solid smooth piece and I can do whatever texture I want on them, but hey, what do I know? Uh, I'm sure these are better for most people because they do take things like contrast paint better. Uh, finally, of course, we want to pop out the edges. As with all things, edges catch light. It's true for metals, it's true for bone, it's true for everything. It's especially true for golden even projects. And so we have to go through and make sure that with just a little white ink, we put a nice little dab, a little dibby dab onto every one of those edges. Freehand is the next stop on this journey and this was a long portion of this. Now, whenever we do freehand, especially on something this size, uh, this requires a lot of research. I had to first go and look at exactly where things belong on knights, like what is every area supposed to contain. This is a dread blade, so there's a little more freedom than with, you know, somebody who's in a house. But there are still some basic tenets and rules that you should follow, and it's something that I've gotten dinged on in the past, so uh, fool me once, uh, you know, shame on you, fool me twice, you never fool me again. And so uh, I then had to go and find things like the dark language, the little chaos runes, and I then wrote out a big list of interesting words to say in this uh, across him. Uh, I as well wanted to have this, this little sort of artistically styled fire pattern. And so little freehand like this, again, helps break up these larger flat surfaces. Even when they have a fun transition on them, it's still a really big area. That's why you'll often see uh, decals put in these areas because it helps to break up the space. It helps to make it look more interesting. Speaking of decals, uh, we're gonna use a few of them. It's not all freehand. Uh, so of course we start by soaking them and then we apply a healthy amount of microsol. Now I wanna take a brief aside here. You'll notice I am slapping, slathering this stuff on, okay? And that's because I'm going to need to move this guy around, uh, this, this deco when I want to get it affixed. And this is also a great example of failure. Look what happens with the deco when I try to take it off. Oops, it sat in the water a little too long, and it broke down too much, 
and now it's sort of snapped. Do we panic? No. With all that microsol on there, we'll be able to scoot this bad boy around and fix it. There's always going to be mistakes. On a big, giant, important project, you will always have mistakes. Push through them. You can work through them. You can fix them. There we go. We got it all back aligned. Now, one thing I will say is that uh, I did varnish in between heavily uh, before I put all that micro set on there. You do not want to put a bunch of liquid over paint without a protective varnish layer. In between many of the steps you've seen here so far, I have varnished this night. He
With all the metals applied, uh, it was time to, of course, give them some shadow. So here I taped off the other areas, brought in the airbrush and the Payne's Gray, and I'm applying some soft, subtle shadows. Now this is very, very, very thin ink. So this is uh, thinned down uh, seven drops of thinner to one drop of ink, and we're just building it up nice and slowly, helping to integrate it into the other metals. Uh, with that shadow done, it's then time to trace every edge on this knight, the inside and outside and every edge of every plate. Uh, does that take a very long time? Yes, it does. Uh, does it absolutely make the knight look better? Yes, it does. Should it be done if you want to, you know, for Golden Demon? Yes, it should. Uh, so just very carefully hitting those edges every time there's a raised edge of any kind both sides of the top, both sides of the bottom, the inside edge towards the color, so on and so forth. Just working all those edges. Now, sometimes when you're doing this, you'll hit a little snag. You'll make a little line that's too fat or something like that. No problem. When you do that, you just go back in with the other color right near the edge and smooth it out. We also have to hit every rivet all the way across the model. So if there's a rivet, it needs to turn silver. And then finally, where there should be bright highlights collected, we take some of that silver and work it in there actually uh, into uh, those highlight spots. So, you know, where I have some center reflections, then I work it off my brush and just feather out the wet paint uh, into the regular steel uh, or magnesium, sorry. I'll also come back in with a, a little 50-50 mix of the silver and the magnesium and kind of smooth that out some more as well. One of the last steps is just these tiny little details like the embedded gems and his little uh, Slanesh icon that's in the center of the helmet, or sorry, of the, the carapace. It's not his helmet, that's his carapace. He has a very big head if that's his helmet. And, uh, and just applying again the magic gold recipe to those to make sure that that's all uh, set to go. And then once the gems are in there, everything's good. Now, this part didn't work as well as I hoped. I used the rattling grime to create the edges, and then it kind of um, was a little darker than I was thinking. I should have really used uh, Garag Garagax Sewer. That was actually the right color. But hey, I end up going and fixing it off camera, so no big deal. And once again, with new metal parts, that means new edge highlights. Every single sharp edge everywhere has to have its pop and has to have its edge. Uh, the last thing I did, of course, was then do the gems. I did those off camera, but those are done in the same way I always do gems. Uh, I have a whole video on gems. That meant it was finally time to assemble him. Oh, goodness gracious. Get him all glued in place. Get all the plates on. Whew, this is a good moment. Like I cannot explain how good this feels when you're working through this guy for this long, and then you, uh, you get to put them all together. It feels amazing. Uh, so... We got this guy all assembled, all of his plates in place, uh, everything fastened in. Now the important part here is I did let him dry for a little while and then came back in and things like where there might have been a little gap beneath his feet and the bottom. I built in some more texture or rocks just to make sure that everything was nice and solid in there. And then finally, we've earned it. That sweet, sweet Citadel... Abaddon Black base rim. After 130 hours, there is maybe no better feeling in the entire world. So there we go. Bane Lash is all finished. Uh, to me, he's sort of a dreadblade since his house is kind of in ruin and not really actively fighting the war, so he's the last remnant of of this first household that fell and then got wiped out. Now he exists as a Dreadblade, uh, roaming through the galaxy, uh, reveling in ecstasy and death uh, for the Dark Princess. So, there you go. That's, uh, that's Bane Lash. Obviously, some pictures are rolling over the top for you here. Uh, this was a heck of a project. I'm excited to have it done, uh, but, I, you know, these are always so rewarding. And I will say that if you've never tried a big giant project like this, do something. You know, think of an idea you've got, plot it out, get into it. Uh, it's a lot of fun. So if you liked this, give it a like, 
subscribe for additional hobby cheating in the future. Uh, don't forget, we've got a Patreon. If you're interested in taking your next step on your hobby journey, uh, you can do so. The link is down below, and you get to join an awesome Discord community full of enthusiastic hobbyists. Uh, as always, I thank you so much for watching this one, and we'll see you next time.